Welcome friends uh, to another episode of Coffee with Ravi. Today we're talking about fatty liver disease. But before I start, uh, I know that there's been a little hiatus and both my apologies and gratitude to all of you who have encouraged me in such a loving way to make sure that I continue to put this out. As you know, the goal is to put out these snippets of information so that you can use this information to better empower yourself, ask these questions, and, and try to take care of your own health. Today, my topic is about fatty liver, or it's currently now the new name for that is steatotic liver disease. The reason that we've talked about this before is that any kind of fat that is surrounding our visceral organs inside the gut, I'm not talking about belly fat that's outside the muzzle of the belly, but inside, getting inside the belly cavity, that seems to be the driver of many diseases, including diabetes, hypertension, cancer-related processes. And specifically today, our focus is on looking at what fat does when it creeps into the liver. The liver is an organ that sits right beneath the rib cage here. And as fat starts accumulating in it, it starts getting engorged. You can see the slide where you can see what a normal liver looks like, what liver with fat looks like, and what a damaged liver looks like. The concern is that fat getting into the liver will cause scar tissue and damage. What the latest guidelines have done is that they've classified it in a different way. And the reason this classification is important is because it gets into fat in the liver. The two main drivers of fat into the liver is weight gain and obesity. And the second driver is alcohol. If there is an overlap, then there's a condition called MET-ALD, where both alcohol and fat in the liver are working together to drive fat into the liver. There are other causes of fat in the liver, which uh, uh, include some congenital errors, some, you know, some, in other words, you're born with some enzymes that are lacking, and that puts fat into the liver. Malnutrition can do it. Certain medications can do it. Human immunodeficiency virus can do it and some environmental toxins like hydrocarbons can do it too. As it relates to people who are consuming some alcohol, where it starts getting to be a problem is if the daily intake is 350 grams per week. So that would make it about greater than 50 grams of alcohol per day in women and greater than 70 grams of alcohol in men. Uh, that puts it into the alcohol more of an alcohol related process. So in other words, bucket one is fat in the liver without any alcohol. The second bucket is the mixed category, which is called MET-ALD. And the third bucket is alcohol related fatty liver. And the way to divide it would be based on the consumption of alcohol. I have a slide here that will show you what common drinks have in terms of how many grams per bottle or per drink. Uh, that will show you how to add up the alcohol that one is consuming. So in other words, the less the alcohol, the better, especially when there is fatty liver, but certainly try to kind of go towards the lower limits of this criteria when, when there is this problem with fat in the liver. In terms of patients who have non-alcohol related fat in the liver, the concern is that there can be a progression of this disease to scarring and then to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis, as we've covered in the past, is a condition where the liver gets scarred and there's some regeneration that's trying to happen. But this kind of half hazard regeneration and scar tissue causes the liver to lose its function. It's estimated that about 50 million of us in the United States have fat in the liver. Of that 50 million, about 12.2 million uh, can have scar tissue that's of significant nature, which is called stage two fibrosis. In other words, fibrosis or scar tissue in the liver can grow from a one to a four, and beyond a four is when you get to cirrhosis. I have a slide for that. And stage two fibrosis is when it starts getting serious. When it goes over four, that's called fat NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with fibrosis and cirrhosis is up to five million. So it's fairly common. However, what causes people, are there any sub-causes that cause the liver with just fat 
to become to go on to become to the scar tissue and those are the greater the duration one has fat sitting in the liver women who are postmenopausal it's also more prevalent in or severe in in patients who are of hispanic or asian and seems to be less severe in african american population if there is associated metabolic disease uh, or metabolic syndrome and the criteria for metabolic syndrome metabolic syndrome is a condition which is a comp which which has these criteria in other words if you have these associated conditions if the body there's a thing called bmi which looks at your body weight and surface area so if your if one has bmi greater than 25 if blood sugars at a fasting level are greater than 100 if the hemoglobin or glycosylated hemoglobin is more than 5.7 or one has diabetes or is on treatment for diabetes if blood pressure is more than 130 over 85 or you're already on antihypertensive treatment if the plasma triglycerides are greater than 150 or if you're on cholesterol lowering medication and if the plasma hdl is less than 40 or you're on cholesterol lowering treatment. If you have one out of these five, it is called metabolic syndrome and people with that tend to progress to scar tissue faster. The other couple of things that cause faster progression is there's a liver test enzyme ratio called AST to ALT or if they have blood platelets, which, which are another parameter you uh, uh, measure in the hemogram are low, that can be an indication of progression. Also, if one has persistently elevated liver tests, that's a problem, you know, uh, because these, these are the groups of patients that tend to progress on the scar tissue. How can we tell further? Once you eliminate other causes of liver disease, there's some blood tests that can tell if there's scar tissue, or we do a test called fiber scan. I have a photograph of that. Sometimes MRIs can be done, but that's more in research setting. But between the blood tests and between the um, uh, fiber scan, you can tell, one can tell if there is any problem with fibrosis uh, or scar tissue, which is a more serious indicator within the setting of fatty liver. In terms of uh, treatments, uh, I, I want to cover that on a separate uh, section, but I wanted to give you some sense of what fatty liver is, what causes progression, but essentially the treatments for this boil down to losing weight there is a, a new medication called resmeteron also the brand name is called resdefra but you got to have a scarring on that scale that i showed you of at least a two to start that that can promote some clearing of the fat in the liver but weight loss is a category but and if there's any other comorbidity whether it be diabetes etc some of these glp ones that we are talking about those empic and like drugs key one can be a candidate uh, we are beginning to look at weight loss through endoscopic reductions of the stomach. We are beginning to think about that and we are setting up a program for that. That can be an option. So really all of these all play together as we look at it, but really the bottom line seems to be staying at our leanest weight, eating a diet that's perhaps a little less in carbs, exercising as much as we can. and looking uh, within the context of where we are trying to figure out you know is this fatty liver stuff come up sometimes that comes up on cat scans where you see the patient ha you know or, or on ultrasounds there will be a mention do we need more evaluation and once we get to the evaluation piece is there scarring is there any of these other associated factors like alcohol that we touched into all those cardiometabolic risk factors that we talked about or the metabolic syndrome factors and then the treatment, we got to nuance a little bit more uh, than what I've uh, talked about today. But that's generally the approach to uh, what we are calling steatotic liver disease, what was previously called fatty liver disease. Uh, uh, and within that, there are these nuances that, that we covered. Thank you. I think our next post will be on uh, pancreatic cancer screening uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, we'll have a conversation with Dr. Cial, one of our partners, to kind of talk about who should be candidates for screening for pancreatic cancer, how can we prevent pancreatic cancer, but that's to come. Uh, please continue to encourage me to do this. Please send your questions and comments uh, uh, if you want me to cover things more in detail. And uh, happy Halloween uh, next week.